Um, good morning and welcome to the third in MIPIM's webinar series, which is examining the UK's regional recovery. This morning, we're looking at the prospects for Scotland's cities. Um, we've had a few technical issues this morning, but hopefully everything will go smoothly now. There's not, um, well, it, it's online, but we still have um, a little bit of housekeeping to do. I don't have to tell you about the fire alarms, but please be aware that this session is being recorded. And we also ask that you, that when you're not speaking, if you can put yourself on mute to, cause that just cuts down on the audio feedback. And um, we have with us today, Chris Dack, uh, Executive Director of Federated Hermes, Susan Aiken, the leader of Glasgow City Council, Nick Penny, who's the head of Scotland with Savills, and John Alexander, the leader of Dundee City Council and chair of the Scottish Cities Alliance. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think, first of all, I'd like to ask Nick and Chris, could you each just briefly explain to us what it, what it is exactly that you do? I think we, we probably all understand what the councillor's role is, but um, just to briefly tell us what it is that your job entails. Okay, I'll go first. Um, thanks, Christy. Um, so I'm Nick Penny. I uh, head Savills in Scotland. We are a multidisciplinary uh, property agency. We cover everything from um, rural land right the way through uh, residential and commercial opportunities. We've got 300 staff in Scotland, over eight offices. Um, and I say we touch pretty much every part of property. So I'm Chris Darrick from Ferry Rated Hermes, based in London, but living in Glasgow, um, and have been living in Glasgow permanently for the last year, obviously. Um, my role in Hermes, I, I am a fund manager. I look after the UK assets of the BT pension scheme. So that's about four billion of assets. Um, and it's a balanced portfolio, but our principal strategy today is uh, exploiting the opportunities in regeneration. Uh, and, you know, comprehensive regeneration and impact investing. So we're engaged in four large schemes uh, with London uh, uh, throughout the UK. So Leeds, Birmingham, Manchester and Bristol, which is a pipeline supply of just short of three million square feet. Um, and we are kind of following, I feel like, the learning curve that we had of King's Cross, where we were extensively involved in the regeneration of that project, which is the best in class. And that's principally what I'm up to just now. Great, thank you both. Um, now, John and Susan, um, one of the recurring themes this morning is going to be um, city deals. So to start with, I would like each of you to maybe say a wee bit about um, how your respective city deals um, are kind of working with other policy areas in, in your cities. Okay. Um, who would you like to start, Christy? I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so I think uh, it's maybe appropriate if Glasgow kicks off because uh, Glasgow is, is one of, it, well, it's the oldest city deal in Scotland and one of the oldest in the UK, whereas John's T-Cities deal is, is one of the most brand spanking new ones. Um, so we're, we've got um, a point of comparison there. Um, but Glasgow City Deal was uh, formally signed in 2015 um, and is now considerably advanced, I think, um, along with Manchester, the most advanced in the UK um, in terms of actual delivery on the ground. It's primarily an infrastructure deal, but not only. Um, there was considerable um, but chunks of that investment given over to employability and, and skills and, and innovation as well. I think the thing about Glasgow is we are, um, or were certainly, um, probably Europe's preeminent industrial post-industrial city, and we are transitioning into an innovation and knowledge-led economy. But increasingly, um, not only using uh, investment regeneration to address the challenges of our post-industrial past, but rediscovering that. Um, talent for innovation and invention that Glasgow was what had when we were the workshop of the world um, in the 19th century when made in Glasgow was was a global brand and it's becoming so again um, and what's very clear is that our city deal has acted as a real catalyst as indeed it was designed to do but perhaps earlier than we had anticipated and the investment that's taking place um, is it, I think because we've been very careful to build a narrative around it and to say 
Uh, we're, we're not just building bridges. We're not just um, uh, reclaiming um, land that was that we um, couldn't be used for for various reasons, either because it was uh, of flood risk or because of a, um, a toxic industrial legacy. Um, we're actually doing this for a purpose, and the purpose is um, is is social justice. Um, it is to address these long-standing challenges that we have in Glasgow, but it is also to continue to position Glasgow as this leading global internationalist innovation and knowledge city. And investors have responded incredibly positively to that. Um, and we're, we're seeing um, some fantastic alliances and partnerships coming in where um, investors are, are aligning their needs and their desired outcomes with the desired outcomes of the city region. Um, the Glasgow metropolitan city region home to 1.8 million people. Um, so a very, very significant um, population and a very significant skills base. Yeah, as uh, Susan rightly says, we are the new kids on the block when it comes to city deals. So uh, whilst it has taken three years of my life that I'll never get back, I was very pleased to be able to finally sign uh, the agreement with both the UK and Scottish government in December of 2020. So we didn't sit idly by during lockdown by any means. Uh, the deal itself, uh, you know, looks to leverage in a quantum of £700 million into the Tayside area. Uh, that's uh, 350 from um, UK and Scottish government and 350 from uh, the um, the, the owners of the projects and private investment as well. And it's a really diverse range of pro uh, projects that looks to capitalise and enhance what the region already has to offer. We have, um, as Susan already mentioned, a real focus on that knowledge-led economy and the opportunities that arise from that. And if I just give you a couple of examples of the, the real strength in the Taste Cities area. So you know, if I take Dundee as the centre point of that, within a 30-minute drive, you have the University of Dundee, you have Abertay University, James Hutton Institute, the University of St Andrews, the University of Highlands and Islands, uh, and the fantastic colleges as well. So there is a real kind of uh, network of organisations that are helping to turn out some fantastic talent, but we're really hoping to make sure that we capitalise on that. And that's through some key growth sectors that we've, we've identified. So uh, biomedical research, looking at life sciences and, and the growth of that potential, uh, cyber security, uh, the digital and creative sectors in particular, a real core strength uh, for the Taste Cities area as well, uh, but also in uh, advanced manufacturing, world-class tourism, uh, and the projects are, are set against a 10-year programme, and we're looking forward to taking that forward fairly rapidly, um, and, and some projects are already on site as we speak, uh, looking to deliver those as quickly as possible. Great, thanks, John. Um, Susan, if I could come back to you briefly for a moment. Um, there was a report presented earlier this month um, outlining Glasgow's success with foreign direct investment. I believe it was something along the lines of third in the UK in terms of attracting FDI. Um, given the considerable challenges and the continuing uncertainty um, so, you know, related to the pandemic, what is the, the council's view on the best way to maintain that momentum and carry that forward? Well, we are very lucky. Our um, in, in, inward investment team in the council, uh, Invest Glasgow, was actually, we were named the, the top large European city for FDI strategy for um, last year, for 2020-21. And that's in large part thanks to uh, the team that we have uh, in the city who are absolutely phenomenal, um, but also the, the ecosystem, the partnership and collaboration ecosystem that exists in the city, which is really mature and long established. Um, we work incredibly closely with, um, and I, I think of it as a, a kind of a, um, a triangle, I suppose, with the, the democratically elected leadership of the council at the top, but very firmly anchored by the incredibly rich academic base that we have in the city. Um, University of Glasgow, a, a top 100 um, U, a world university, and the University of Strathclyde, uh, one of the world's leading engineering universities in particular, and also two um, arts institutions, which uh, in the Glasgow School of Art and the um, Royal Conservatoire, which are among the best in the world of their type. 
um, and, and Glasgow Caledonian University, which is, uh, has its own specialisms, an incredibly rich um, academic um, foundation there in the city and a really, really strong relationship with our business community. Um, long standing, mature and, and further developed over the past um, three years or so that I've been doing this job. So our Chamber of Commerce um, is an incredibly important partner, but also our Glasgow Economic Leadership Board, which I co-chair with the principal of Strathclyde University um, and which regularly meets with key sectoral leaders. So we have constant exchange and dialogue and it allows um, investors to see a city um, that is, is looking at all angles. It's looking at what matters to investors. Um, how, you know, how can we help? How do we make Glasgow as open and uh, welcoming as possible? And I think our reputation for business friendliness goes before us. Alongside of that, I think we've got a really strong story, a really strong narrative. Glasgow is distinctive. We stand out, um, you know, we're, in the past, not always for good reasons, but now increasingly for really, really strong reasons. So we are, we are the global green city for 2020, named by uh, the UN as such, obviously with the host city of COP26. These are not coincidences. These are testament to the fact that the, the um, investment strategy that Glasgow has pursued um, is clearly demonstrating a path to sustainability, to inclusive growth, that is telling a story um, that investors are reacting really positively and really strongly to. Um, and that vision and narrative, which is not just from me as the leader of the city, but from that Team Glasgow, really well-established Team Glasgow, um, that's been essential to our success in the past. It's going to be even more essential for us to pick up and recover from the, uh, the, the blows that the pandemic have dealt us, which are big. I mean, Glasgow's economy has... Um, we are one of the cities that has, has taken one of the biggest hits in the UK. However, we're also projected to be able to recover perhaps more quickly than other cities precisely because of these strengths. Yeah, indeed. Um, John, in that kind of same theme in terms of the, the challenges presented by the pandemic, um, could you talk a bit about what you see as the sort of... Um, you know, the hurdles to be overcome by Dundee, and then also in your capacity as chair of the Scottish, City, Scottish Cities Alliance. Um, also kind of how those contrast with perhaps what might be going on in say Edinburgh or Aberdeen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, Susan's laid out some of the key strengths, but of course there are huge challenges for all of the cities. And like Glasgow, post-industrial city, uh, which suffered decline over many decades, uh, we are set to take a significant hit as a result of the pandemic. But of course, it's not just the pandemic. We've also got Brexit to deal with and the implications that flow from that. Uh, so there's a combination of factors that play into the difficulties, I suppose, that face cities as we move forward. Um, but again, it's that point about the resilience that exists within those cities and particularly within our business sector as well. And the only way that we're going to come out of uh, this pandemic uh, with that core strength still retained is through a combination of things. So it's about that leadership. It's about the policy landscape. It's about the support that's at play. It's about collaboration as well. And that is a key component of the work that I undertake as leader of the, the Scottish Cities Alliance uh, and how we conduct our businesses such as the seven cities of Scotland as well. Now the same report that identified you know Glasgow as being one of the the hardest hit also identified that there is you know um, other cities in Scotland that will be uh, less hit so Edinburgh being one of those key examples because of the nature of that economy that diverse uh, resilient economy base in Edinburgh is set to be you know, across the whole of the UK, actually, um, one of the economies that is least hit. But again, that doesn't mean that there won't be, uh, you know, not a significant impact. Uh, and we've got to continue to work together to identify what the areas are that we, that we can collaborate, that we can try to make inroads and, and improve the situation as we move forward as well. And I think the reality is we all are, you know, in the same boat right now. Um, and we don't quite know exactly when this period is going to end or how we are going to come out of it. But we are planning for that. And it's about that strategic framework and making sure that we all 
are, are looking forward and trying to plan for that eventuality so that we're prepared uh, as we move forward over the coming months as well. So it's really important that there's a clear line of sight Sorry. around that plan and what you uh, look to take forward as well. Sorry, Nick, I just wanted to ask, I did, sorry to cut in, but you, you mentioned about that forward planning. And um, I mean, it, is that happening? Have we moved out of sort of, what do you say, kind of scramble and cope with it mode and moved into something that's more like, um, okay, here's the way forward. Uh, to a degree, I don't think any of us have um, all the answers as we stand right now, but each of the cities has taken forward, um, you know, the equivalent of a recovery plan to identify the key areas of the economy that are going to need the most support, but also the key areas of the economy that are going to help us grow our way out of the current situation in terms of the economic realities that we face. So, you know, for me, uh, in a Dundee context, signing the Tay Cities deal in December is actually, you know, has an advantage rather than perhaps if we had signed it um, later or earlier, because it's live and we can get that resource deployed very quickly and rapidly to try and achieve the results that we want to see and support the broader economy. But again, there are other projects, other investment uh, and developments that are still in the pipeline. Um, people may be aware of the suggestions around the e-gaming arena, the Eden project coming to Dundee. So none of our cities are sitting still uh, just dealing with the here and now. We are very much looking to the future and continuing to deploy uh, the resource that we have, either financial or the capacity within our teams, to make sure that we build that resilience, that we build and expand on what we were already doing. Because the point that you made, uh, Christine, your question was that, you know, uh, the cities of Scotland are actually a very attractive uh, venue, I suppose, for inward investment. And that bears out in all the statistics. If you look at 2019, there was 101 uh, investment projects that came to, the, came to Scotland, the Scottish cities, that was a 7.4% increase on 2019. So there's a real direction of travel, a real upward trajectory, and that's something that we all want to continue with. Great, thanks. Um, I think you mentioned that um, in terms of the degree of severity of the hit, um, Edinburgh has been reckoned to, to have been less affected than some of the other cities. Um, Nick, you're actually based in Edinburgh. And I think one of the other things that we've seen um, through this, uh, there's been a real divergence in um, the commercial property market between the office and retail sector versus um, warehousing, industrial, logistics type properties. Um, as it happens, a couple of those are quite your specialties. So what I was wondering from your viewpoint is when, see that divergence, when might we see that, what is it going to take to get that to sort of level out, if you will, and, and sort of come back together? And how long might that be before that happens? Um, big, que <laughs> big questions there, Christy, but um, listen, you're, you're right. There's the office sector in the short term over the past 12 months has, has, um, has taken a hit and we've all been working from home and there's been questions about you know, the future of the office as we knew it before. I think as time has gone on and occupiers have, have worked from home and realised that I think initially there was a there was a novelty value of working from home uh, during the summer, like you know, lighter days, longer days, and the ability to, to travel less, commute less, it was, it, there was a novelty factor. I think as we've we've um, experienced the winter months of working at home and, and lockdown, I think the, the benefits of working in an office environment have undoubtedly been realised by more and more people. The, the collaboration, as, as John has talked about and Susan's talked about, in an office environment, as well as in the wider economy between public and private sector to make things happen, um, but within an office environment. So I think going forward from an office perspective, we see offices very much being um, front and centre in, in the resurgence of economies and, and city centres. They may have to change. And offices will, will will probably need to change to create spaces for people, I say, to collaborate, to support each other, for to mentor younger people, to provide the social environment that offices obviously do. Um, the retail sector, touching on that brief, briefly, um, retail was going through a real challenge uh, pre-COVID, and COVID has accelerated a lot of trends. Um, and, and retail, the, the the change in retail has has undoubtedly been um, most notable, no, most notable out of all the commercial property sectors. Um, 
but some retailers have absolutely thrived during the COVID period. And, and there's been this, those that have had an online presence have undoubtedly benefited. And some of those that were, were behind the curve and probably, to be honest, struggling pre-COVID have now find themselves in very difficult situations. You know, we're seeing very innovative ways of repurposing some of these old retail um, properties and, and assets. Um, the House of Fraser store, I was speaking to John earlier about, you know, that as a being repurposed as, as, a, as a visitor center for, for uh, by Diageo for Johnny Walker. Um, and seeing other very, very um, forward thinking and, and, and fantastic developments uh, likes of the St. James Quarter, which is a big mixed use development, which brings me on to, to full circle back to what Chris was saying about the exemplar of King's Cross in terms of how that has regenerated a part of London, um, but brought in education, offices, um, retail, all sorts of also sort of culture, all sorts of different um, things that attract people to that place. And where we're seeing investment and the investment in Scotland, certainly from a commercial perspective, rather than broader investment into infrastructure and other, other investment into, into the country, but certainly into, into commercial property and property generally, um, there's been a significant increase in overseas investment into, into Scotland since global financial crisis and in the commercial sector, the average has been about 50% over the last um, 10 years, where before that was probably below 20. Um, so Scotland provides a very, very attractive um, place for, for overseas investors for a whole heap of reasons in the real estate world, stable political environment relative to many other jurisdictions, a long established uh, legal system, um, very attractive lease structures, and relative pricing to other jurisdictions globally, where most of these players are now global, uh, makes it a very attractive place. But going forward, the focus very much on mixed use, uh, sustainable places, um, places that offer um, um, opportunities for, for real diversity and inclusion, as, as Susan's talked about, um, that will, will always, always create better opportunities and ideas, but very much having a social benefit to, to society as well. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, sorry, we just had a few questions starting to come in, but before I go on to those, um, I wanted to ask Chris, well, Nick, you, you mentioned the need for offices to change. Chris, I know you're a big um, fan of the, the whole idea of creating high quality spaces, not just offices, um, particularly places, well, when you talk about some of your developments like Sky Park in Glasgow, but in terms of creating those spaces, um, what, exactly does that entail, particularly when we are looking at a post-pandemic world? You're on mute, Chris. Beg your pardon. It's interesting, we always talk about post-pandemic world, but Nick alluded to the pre-pandemic world. You know, there were structural themes evident well before COVID-19 struck changing patterns, you know, there was uh, urbanization, there was um, changing in ec economic circumstances, you know, climate change is, is a massive issue. Um, so, I mean, we see kind of, um, you know, Brexit uh, and for that matter, COVID-19 is fairly short-term issues. We're taking a very long-term view here and believe that climate change is probably the number one issue that we have to contend with uh, for future generations. In reality, so in terms of in terms of where we where we've got to and, and and how we've got to where we are, it's just through a kind of process of learning. So well before COVID nineteen, we put in place um, the ability to deploy capital into city centres, uh, strong city centres with universities, as soon as alluded to, where graduate retention is is is, is key and therefore attractive to employers because we're involved in a war for talent here. Everything, everybody, all the corporates. Are, are, are aggressively going after the talent and that the councils need to match that, frankly, and they need to kind of set out their stall to retain their graduates and then attract the corporates. In Birmingham, for example, we leased 150,000 square feet to PwC. That is now their global hub. They're not going to take any more graduates uh, through London anymore. Uh, and we had a conversation with them about another project just north of London. They said that's too close to London. We need to be further away from London to attract and retain the best talent. Uh, so there's the, these themes have been playing out well before COVID-19 and they'll continue to, to do so going forward. And that goes for retail um, as well. And, you know, the industrial, you know, the, the kind of warehousing that we have that's coming out of the ground everywhere just now. But city centres, more required to be repurposed 
and that will involve partnership. It can't be done without partnership. We could not have, you know, we could not have delivered King's Cross um, had we not had partnership with the kind of landowners. That was a kind of joint venture arrangement. The land was appropriate. Everyone was patient, long-term patient capital. We couldn't have built a square, which is four, four or five times the size of George Square in London. You know, land values in London and viability, normally we don't permit that. But because we had 60 acres to work with, we can take a view and create a proper place. But if you're building, dealing with building by building situations or, you know, tight areas of land, then it's very difficult to create that sense of place and, and, and you know, attract people into it. Thank you. Um, there's been a few questions coming in. I would like to put, um, one of them was specifically directed towards um, John and Susan. Um, are there any key international markets you are looking for investment from? The reason I ask is, although from Scotland, I now live and work in France, and the French system is difficult for property investment, and Scotland would be a fantastic opportunity for anyone with a small to medium-sized business looking for a sympathetic market. Uh, yeah, do you want to uh, go first, uh, John? Yeah. yeah, thank you. I mean, if you look at the current statistics of where the inward investment is coming from, so 35% of inward investment uh, coming into Scotland is based within the US, 7% from uh, Norway, Germany, and Japan. And I think it's 9% uh, from France, if memory serves me correctly. So those are our core marketplaces at present, but that doesn't of course mean that we aren't always looking for opportunities out with that. Now, there's a very Euro strong European market, clearly MIPM being a major European event, of course, uh, is part of that discussion, part of that mix. Uh, we are always looking for opportunities. So I know in the last couple of years, for example, I've hosted delegations from South Korea, Australia, the US. So there's a real interest there. And, and so what I would say is we're not precious uh, in terms of where that investment comes from, so long as it is on the right terms and it is right for uh, the, the city that it comes from. Uh, to, but the reality is we do have some strong markets there are some strong opportunities and relationships that have been built up over a number of years and and there is a clear synergy between uh, the strategy that's been deployed at a national level in terms of targeting key markets for further growth uh, and also those that are perhaps not where we would like them to see and I know that Ivan McKee uh, in particular is the minister uh, responsible uh, has launched uh, that kind of nationwide strategy for attracting further investment from other key growth markets where there is further potential to attract investment into Scotland. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, come talk to us. Uh, I, I think there's always room for that conversation um, and, and, you know, it will be very well received, I'm sure. Susan, just uh, quickly, any specific markets that, that uh, Glasgow... I mean, I, I think that, that John's uh, summed it up very well. Um, we are uh, certainly not looking to turn anyone away, put it that way. Um, we're, you know, we are absolutely open to the world. Um, Glasgow and Edinburgh and increasingly Dundee um, and, and Aberdeen as well, particularly obviously in the energy sector. But those four big... Scottish cities in particular, but our other three colleagues uh, are coming coming up strongly. Are you know we are positioning ourselves very firmly as global cities. Um, Glasgow and Edinburgh are already in that position. Others, um, you know, coming through very very strongly on the global stage. And I think the other point, um, perhaps that makes us distinctive in a wider UK context, is that all of the Scottish cities. Um, have been very, very clear to say that we continue to regard ourselves as European cities um, and as absolutely um, willing, not just willing, but eager to continue uh, to have a very strong relationship um, with, uh, with EU, other EU countries um, and, and that we remain, our doors remain absolutely open to uh, European partners and to European investment. Um, Okay, we've got a few more other questions as well coming in, quite a few questions coming in as well, but I wanted to, to squeeze in one that I was particularly keen to get in and then we'll come back to some of the viewers' questions. Um, Nick and Chris, one of the complaints that we often, that you often hear when you're talking to developers is that the planning process is, is unnecessarily long and complicated and so forth. Um, could, could each of you maybe give me one or two points, specific points, where you think this could be um, improved? 
I mean, I think it's it's, it's a very and it, a relevant and very good question that because it, you know there is when you. I mean, I've got a few examples actually. I mean, recently we we acquired a difficult uh, situation in in Bristol and and and, and shook cans with with the council on how we're going to how we're going to manage it going forward. And Savills, in fact, are acting on our behalf in that in, the, in this one. And that was a really interesting, a very enthusiastic welcome at the high level, at senior level. That you get very welcome and very open to ideas. Um, they were very honest with us because the, the first thing he said was when we sat down was that Bristol was a, a place where good ideas come to die, which I thought was uh, interesting. But uh, but we've, we've gone well and we've, we've been going through a process, but we've now been engaged now for over 18 months in trying to secure planning for a, for a, for a site which is situated right in the heart of the city centre, which has not been occupied for 35 years, which is absolutely unbelievable. We're about the third person to try to do this so there's something not right about that and and it's not the council or necessarily there is but it gets below the level and it gets into the, the team we recognize that they're short staffed you know and that, that's an issue we recognize that there's an awful lot of pressure groups out there that that have their say and actually they're more vocal than people that actually want to see something happen so that whole kind of situation is is not not very helpful and it, it does cost us an awful lot of money to set the groundwork right to get the development so people don't realize that we've probably spent about towards two million already trying to get a planning application through and we haven't you know we haven't even submitted it yet so that that you know that's a challenge for us as investors that we need to know that we can work with councils and that we can deliver these strategies in glasgow which is interesting we have sky park which is a phenomenal you know asset it's it, but it is it's, it's, i suppose it, it's a very popular estate but when we bought it, our view was that it was un underloved, undermanaged, um, and we felt that we could do something with that. So we have been looking at um, a variety of initiatives, how to kind of, if you like, retrofit the place into an existing estate, um, which is really quite dynamic with some really kind of interesting occupiers in it. And around about the, the estate are plots of land. Uh, and we have been trying to get permission to demolish a building on a site which sits just north of COP26's venue for near on two years and it's not been occupied for 30 years. I find that utterly unbelievable that that's, you know, it's taken this long to get agreement in place. We're working now with the guys and we've got their consent and it will be cleared by the end of April but it's taken a heck of a long time to do that. We could have well have replaced that building with something else but now had there been a more progressive kind of uh, partnership arrangement. Yeah, thank you Chris. Nick, one or two specific points where you could see things could be improved? Um, yeah, listen, I think Chris has, Chris has highlighted some of the specific challenges there. You know, I do think going forward you know, to pick up you know, a word that's been used a, a bit on the panel today, you know, particularly by, particularly by Susan in terms of collaboration, you know, I think a more collaborative approach particularly around a wider ESG agenda where all the stakeholders might be more aligned uh, to help facilitate planning in a, in a more efficient way, perhaps, I think is, is potentially a way forward. You know, stakeholders and the wider ESG agenda is everybody, you know, from individual level, from, from uh, public sector, private sector, corporates, you know, everybody needs to be, a, you know, needs to be involved. You know, it's front and centre everywhere, as, as Chris has alluded to. And I wonder whether that might provide um, a route towards some more efficiency. But the reality is planning departments are under-resourced. There, there are always a lot of people with a lot of interested, uh, interest in, in what's happening round about them, whether they be individuals or, or, or other stakeholders in, in local areas. And that always brings huge challenge and these voices need to be listened to. Uh, but undoubtedly, the, the, this, this, the system and the process is far from efficient and there's a number of reasons for that. I guess we could probably spend a panel and a half and another half on trying to debate the, the challenges around about the planning system, but it does need to get better. And I think post COVID as we're looking to regenerate the economy in Scotland and in our cities and, 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 and right across the globe, you know, I think in Scotland, certainly planning has got a part to play in, in creating new jobs um, and stimulating the economy and, and helping us return to where we were pre COVID as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Nick, you're, you're absolutely right. I suppose in terms of trying to get a recovery going, being agile is one of the things that I guess everyone's going to refer back to and the need to be able to move quickly. 
Um, one of the questions, another one of the questions that's come in from one of the viewer, viewers, is that what we do online? But anyway, um, and I guess this is directed towards everyone. What opportunities do you see COP26 offering to promote the commercial property sector in Glasgow and Scotland? Um, don't know if it, who, it, Susan, it's, it's, it's your home turf, so maybe you want to say something about that and then maybe come back to either yourself or uh, Chris or Nick then, thanks. Um, well, the opportunity is that uh, the world is coming to Glasgow, I think, first, first and foremost. Uh, the, world, the world is coming to Scotland and to Glasgow, um, and we've got an opportunity to uh, showcase what we're doing um, and showcase what we're doing particularly um, and indeed specifically on, on sustainability and on um, a green uh, economic future um, and, and a green infrastructure future as well. So um, if, if you're a commercial property developer who um, is, is working in a sustainable way, who has got ideas either for retrofitting existing buildings or you know, developments that, that fit in um, with, with green building and green futures, then Glasgow is your opportunity and Scotland your opportunity because uh, this will be an absolutely unparalleled um, event. The, there, there's no question. Um, and I think the, the key thing about COP26, well, there's two things about COP26 in particular that I think are going to be um, very distinctive. One is that cities are going to be really, really important. Um, COP26 is going to be the COP of cities. Um, and very much tied in with that is the focus on delivery and action at COP26. And I, you know, I've been privileged um, as the leader of the host city over the past um, six months in particular to have um, been able to speak and engage in all manner of global conversations about sustainability. And what's very clear is that the ambition for COP and what the constituencies around COP who are not necessarily the nation states, if you like. So, so the parties at the Conference of the Parties are the nation states. They are the ones who, um, you know, we need, the world needs, the planet needs to sign up to an agreement that will actually deliver um, on the, the promises of, of the Paris Agreement. But there's an increasing view from local government, and particularly from cities and also from the private sector, from businesses, um, who, are, who are engaged in these conversations about saying to national governments, we are going to do this anyway, we will deliver, and actually we are the ones who can deliver and will deliver. You create a legislative framework and, and you need to resource it, um, but it is, it's local government um, and it's the private sector who are actually going to make the changes that will, um, on the ground, that will reach those, um, those targets. Uh, for, for reducing global temperatures. So um, the, the, the real focus in COP26 is going to be about practical examples of change, practical examples of delivery on climate action, um, actually in situ in cities, um, either planned you know, or um, in, in process or already there. Um, and certainly we want Glasgow to be in a position of being able to, to offer people coming, any number of examples, whether that's commercial property, residential property, um, whether it's our, our infrastructure investment, you know, no matter what it is, we want to be able to point to something and say, there's what's possible. And the argument I always say is that because of Glasgow's particular challenges, because of the challenges that come around our, um, our, our, our built structure, the actual physical shape of the city and that post-industrial legacy, if we can do it in Glasgow, you can do it anywhere. Um, the barriers in Glasgow are such that the rewards are also, and um, the rewards in terms of, of the um, of, of um, carbon reduction gain, if that makes any sense, um, are, are such that um, this, this is where we get the big wins. Um, if we can do it in Glasgow, no one else has any excuse. And, and there's that's part of the reason why um, we are the host city and, and why we are um, emblematic in many ways of both the challenges and the opportunities um, involved in um, actually really engaging and being part of the delivery and part of the solution on climate action. Thanks, Susan. Um, there's another question that's come in. Um, do the speakers feel that there is a real and open mind, an active open mind, and financial commitment by investors and property owners to diversify in properties 
to then bring jobs. Um, Nick, can I come back to you on that, please? Yeah, so I, miss, I missed a bit of the question there, Christy, but I think it was, is there a commitment from investors to invest in property to help create jobs? Is that Was that, in essence, the question? Yes, um, the, the property owners to, di to diversity in properties to, di to then bring jobs, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, the diversity in terms of, you know, the broader diversity agenda, the importance of diversity, cognitive diversity, cultural diversity to solve complex problems is 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 absolutely front and centre. You know, it's, it forms part of the wider ESG agenda, you know, diversity and inclusion. Um, so I think property owners, property investors fully accept that, fully understand it. Ultimately, in the short term, um, and I do think there is a change here, and Chris can maybe maybe elaborate from from an investor's perspective. But where um, ESG and sustainability is now forming much a much bigger part of the decision making process when investing, whereas probably even until eighteen months ago it didn't play anywhere near the part that it's playing now. You know this whole this wider diversity and the the, the impact on the environment, the impact on the economy, the impact the social impact. Is, is and that's difficult to measure obviously is becoming a much much greater part of decision making process but we are seeing it you know every meeting i have internally externally you know, with clients with other stakeholders and in, in the wider industry esg is front and center therefore the decision making process is definitely um focused on diversity inclusion esg and, and all the rest of it thank you nick um, I, I could just add to that, actually, sure. um, you know, that, I mean, Hermes, you know, when I, before I joined Hermes, it was recognised, and Nick, I don't know whether you can back this up, it was recognised as a leader in responsible investment. Uh, and, and since my, I've been there now 11 years, and since before then, the real estate team has been measuring its CO2 reductions from the properties it's managed. Uh, so they, they have been doing it and walking the walk, talking the talk for, for over, over 10 years, certainly. Um, and I think now, today, it's become, you know, much more important. I mean, I think a lot of people talk about it being integrated and, in, you know, into their investment philosophy and process. And I think it's, you know, even at Hermes, even though we were doing it, it was a line item, you know, in the report, uh, that maybe at the back end of it, but now it's front and centre. Uh, together with the net zero pathway, uh, so we are, you know, we are absolutely bought into the the requirement here, and I, we're not the only investor. I think it will become market practice in the future, which means we need to be thinking a lot more about what we can do with assets to make them kind of fit for purpose, and you know that impact that uh, Nick was talking about and measuring the kind of social uh, uh, benefits of what we do. We have been doing that as well. We, we engage a, an organization called Regenerous who have measured backward looking the benefits of uh, our investments into Kings Cross, Leeds, Manchester. But now what we're doing now, rather than looking backward, we're, we're actually, with that experience, we're now setting targets for ourselves. So we're starting to think of what are our targets here? And then we can measure how we've performed against those targets as the development progresses. So it is, it is possible to measure the wider impact on the communities that in which the assets sit. And I think that's a very important part of investment going forward. Thanks very much. Um, I don't want to get sucked too much down the political route, but the question has been asked. So I'd like to maybe come back to you first, Chris. Um, what are the views of the panel of the likely impact of Scottish independence on future inward investment into Scottish cities? Um, something to look forward to or be wary of. Perhaps you first, Chris, and then you next. Yeah, I mean, it's we live in a global. It's a global market we are in. The, the, the flows of capital are, are not restricted to the UK. When you talk to US investors or Australian investors, they don't talk about. The, obviously, the UK for them is mainly London first of all, and then it develops from that. But by and large, look at Europe, and they look at kind of investing in key cities in Europe. Scot Scotland has key cities. And they will remain attractive. We're seeing German investors still buying assets in, you know, in, in Edinburgh. They're doing, they're buying a couple just now, for example. So the flows of capital will continue. What I would say is that, that you know, there's certainly from an inst UK institutional perspective, it's much more relevant in my kind of world. Me getting approval to buy Sky Park was not a cakewalk 
regardless of how good an asset is and how well located it is. There was a lot of concern about Scottish independence and not that it's going to be, you know, in the full, again, it's a kind of short term thing, isn't it? Because once you get through it and it settles down, if it is, you know, if it is independent, it is, and it, the market will deal with that and adjust and it'll settle down and hopefully in the long term it'll be fine. But it, whilst the uncertainty remains, like Brexit, like COVID-19 in the short term, there is, you know, there's a real issue about getting money into the market. And the longer the uncertainty goes on, i.e. if it keeps on coming back, then, you know, it's going to become less attractive, to be honest with you, because it becomes more illiquid as an investment. And, you, you know, as an investor, you know, you are looking, you know, one thing that you've got to look at for a pension scheme is can you get your money out when you require it? So liquidity is absolutely critical. And if there are concerns about liquidity due to political uncertainty, then Scotland, I'm afraid, will, will struggle to compete with other parts of the UK. Thanks, Chris. Your views, Nick? Yeah, I mean, Chris has <clears throat> Chris has given a, a textbook answer there. I think you, know, I think the you know the the, the, the impact is very much around the uncertainty that it causes, um, for, and that is probably greater for the UK institutional market and and the more domestic market. Overseas investors are are, are investing um, in many different jurisdictions that have many different challenges. Um, so that some of the overseas investors, that the, the uncertainty caused by independence, um, chat around about independence, is is probably less than some of the UK um, investors. But the reality is, the UK institutional market is still the principal owner of commercial real estate in the UK. So therefore, that that is important. And and if they're not there, and the impact on on values, and the impact on on sentiment, and the impact on on demand from that that part of the market is and has been proven previously to be fairly significant so yeah it's the uncertainty that that, it, that generates is the biggest issue great thanks um i'd probably like to put this in uh, changing tack here i'd like to put this next question i guess to john to start with but then if anybody else wants to come in um once again from one of the viewers um has have there been any cuts to the investment support by local governments and central government in growth investment in Scotland. Um, there's been a lot of money having to be thrown around to tackle a lot of immediate problems. So I guess it's a, it's, it's quite a legitimate uh, question. Um, yeah, and, and I'll give you the best answer I possibly can. I can't speak on behalf of every single local authority in Scotland because I, I, I don't know is the honest answer, but from certainly from my experience and obviously from the announcements that we saw yesterday during uh, Kate Forbes's uh, budget speech, it, it was very clear that the investment is set to continue on those key areas uh, that we've all described here today. And that attraction of investment is absolutely essential. And it's that, that combination of public uh, resource that that public policy supporting the private sector not only at a time of need but forward planning and I think that came out quite strongly yesterday uh, during the speech that was provided in, in the Scottish Parliament but it's also replicated at a local level so you know Susan will be able to wax lyrical I'm sure about what Glasgow are doing in terms of uh, continuing to invest and support uh, business going forward and, and that growth potential but here in Dundee we're absolutely uh, it's a priority so far from cutting investment in those areas, we want to enhance and grow the level of investment uh, that's going into attracting and growing um, you know, development and, and investor uh, operations within the city context. So I, I think it's going the other way um, and it needs to, because you know, given the situation that we're facing right now, you know, that government borrowing, whether it's UK, Scottish government, is going to have to be paid back. And the way in which you pay back is you grow your economy, you grow your taxation base. And that is absolutely where we all have to focus. And of course, jobs is absolutely essential. And whilst the level of job losses um, in some local authorities has been greater than others, and I know, you know, Glasgow and Dundee, because of that post-industrial uh, kind of history, uh, we're already starting from slightly behind the curve, I suppose, but we will catch up very quickly. And our focus is absolutely on that, uh, not only the retention of the current level of jobs within the city, but that growth. So it has to be a key priority uh, going forward. And if what we end up doing is, you know, a slash and burn approach, then everybody suffers as a result of that. So it can't be a, a cuts approach. Great, thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're getting close to the end of our time. So. Um, there was the, the big question um, on everybody's mind. I did give you all a heads up about this yesterday, so I hope you've had to think about it. 
And, and that is, you know, what, what is a, a sustainable recovery going to look like? Um, and I mean, when I say sustainable, I guess I'm, I'm talking both in environmental and economic terms, um, particularly, I suppose, specifically economic, but I, I, I would imagine that, that one or all of you would argue that those two go hand in hand. Um, Nick, can we start with you, please? Yeah, sustainable recovery, I think, uh, looks like the success of it looks like, um, you know, the importance of repurposing of properties, of skill sets, you know, transferring them to areas of the economy that are, that are, um, that are growing. You know, John's talked about it, you know, creating jobs, which will ultimately create tax revenues and allow the, allow the economy to grow. It will be really important. You know, repurposing of real estate assets, you know, that's what, what I'm interested in, what Chris is interested in. You know, the sustainability of, of development going forward is, you know, is on many levels. We've talked about it, you know, 40% of carbon emissions come from real estate. You know, that's embodied carbon in terms of structure and, and actually putting these buildings up historically or, or currently. And then the rest is the, the operational carbon, which is a bit easier to deal with in terms of sourcing more renewable energy sources you know, photovoltaics, LED bulbs, all, all that good stuff. Um, and actually the importance of, of what we do around about, um, you know, refurbishing buildings um, going forward. I think there's 80% um, of the existing building stock will still be standing in 2050. So we need to understand how we deal with the existing stock, not just with new stock. Um, and then finally, again, the collaboration word, you know, this is all about all stakeholders in, in the road to recovery working together individually, um, you know, corporately and, and, the, and the public sector. So you know, those, are, those are my three things for a, for a sustainable recovery. Great, thanks. Um, Susan, could you go next, please? Uh, yeah, I think it's about um, making sure that uh, social justice, climate justice and economic growth all work hand in hand with each other, that, we, that we regard those not as separate things to be dealt with in separate silos, uh, but as absolutely interconnected, um, e um, mutually supporting areas of work um, that, that drive each other forward. Um, so that we, I, I think it, it, it's going to about having the, the courage to say no to things sometimes, which perhaps hasn't always, I know it hasn't ha always happened in Glasgow in the past, didn't always happen following the, the 2008 financial crisis, some of the developments um, and investments and jobs that came into the city would, are, were not what you would associate with the term sustainability. They didn't help to build resilience. They didn't really help to add long-term value um, to the city. Um, so we, we need as a city to work um, and we want actively want to work with investors who um, understand exactly as, as Nick's described um, and you know, Chris has alluded to very strongly in, in his previous um, answers that um, the economic gain um, and that financial gain and commercial gain um, go hand in hand with a contribution to wider society. Um, whether that's the future of the planet in terms of carbon emissions, or whether that's um, supporting and improving uh, the places and the lives of the people in the place that you've chosen to come and invest in. If, if you come to a place and come to a city and want to become part of it, um, and, and that's the kind of investment that, that I want to see and that I really welcome, is people who, who want to come and be part of Glasgow, who want to come and have that long-term relationship with us in the city, um, then it, you know, it's in your interest to make sure that you've got that thriving skills base, for example, that you've got um, Sorry, sorry, Susan. Thank you. I would just need to. I'm aware we're running out of time, and I want to give um, John and Chris both a chance to sort of um, to put their bit in. Um, sorry, John. Quickly, could you um, kind of add your thoughts? What um, what what will the sustainable recovery look like? I think Susan and, and Nick have really hit the nail on the head in terms of what they've already said. So I'll, I'll keep mine very brief. But it's all about social responsibility, isn't it? It's about being part of something bigger and recognising that your role in that is just as important as anybody else's. And that relationship, that collaboration between local government and the private sector and that discussion around how that then is deployed and enhances the local environment is absolutely key. And, and we're already seeing that, you know, the private sector uh, are live to these issues and actually 
Um, to be fair to the private sector, absolutely want to be part of that. There is a real inherent social responsibility that they're bringing to the table. We don't often have to ask, um, which is great in itself. So um, I'll keep it there and let Chris have the final word. Thanks, John. Chris? Yeah, I think it's been well covered, so I don't need to go over that, all that ground. We, we absolutely get the social responsibility bit. Uh, and so it's a very much a hand in glove kind of uh, investment philosophy that we have. We need to make an impact and have an influence on the, the, the areas and the communities in which we invest. So I think it's all about creating that environment to allow, you know, uh, to allow cities to, to, to attract retain talents and to encourage people within the city to, to grow and uh, become you know, better uh, and more wealthy, I think. We need to correct that in balance as well. Great, okay, well, we're just about, it was maybe a minute or two over, so apologies for that if uh, any of you have been held up. I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists for um, being with us today and to everybody who logged in to attend. Um, I probably should have said at the beginning, I'm Christy Dorsey, I'm a business journalist with the Herald, but I'm not really the important one. It's the, the folks here who've been having their say. Um, just a final reminder to everyone to keep your, keep your eyes peeled for uh, more MIPM regional events that are gonna be announced in the coming days and weeks. And other than that, um, have a happy Friday. Bye.